you. Hey, I got my hat. I'm in. Welcome. My name is Wiebe Dreyer. I'm a CEO of Rabobank Globally, and I'm here to welcome you and to say how honored I am to speak to you here today on this island with this hat. Um, I want to thank all of you coming from Australia, New Zealand, and the world at large. And I would like to thank a special guest. So Rain, give me a paw. Thank you. Special guest, Rain. Thanks, Zoom. I also want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the country on which we meet today, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and recognize their continuing connection to the land, waters, and culture. We pay our respect to their elders past, present, and emerging. So thank you um, for being here. And I know there's one thing you shouldn't be joking about, and that's rain. But I couldn't just stop giggling when I heard the name of the dog that was just here. His name is Rain. So I thought the message that we saw here is actually for me to say, thank you, Rain. So thank you, Rain. But the team that organized this, this little act where the two border collies come on stage said, yeah, but the border collies actually, they exemplify what a banker stands for. And let me, hear, let me let, share with you what they said a banker stands for, a border collie stands for. He's loyal, he's kind, he listens very well, he does what you say, and I learned if you give him something extra, he actually does immediately what you say. So uh, I, think, um, I think if you think of a banker in the future, you'll think of a border collie. And I, uh, I'm, so to speak, the top dog of the bank, but um, there is another top dog that, that really ought to be uh, speaking about, and that's Peter Noblach. Peter, where are you here sitting? He is the top dog of Australia and New Zealand, so uh, please give him the best uh, regard that I am. So you can't see Peter differently from a border collie from now on. That's just a pity from, uh, from here on. Uh, Peter, I'm sorry to do that to you. But, um, uh, so all joking aside, um, we are deeply honored to have you here and to speak to you, to host you as our most important relation, our most important asset. I would argue what we have here in the room is the national, the, the Australian and New Zealand Parliament of Agriculture. Uh, and you are our partners. And so we're very honored to have you here in this room. I spent uh, the days of Tuesday and Wednesday in, up north in, uh, uh, in the, the, the town of Roma. And I visited one of our clients, and we drove into their, uh, their, their, their lands. And we could see firsthand the impact of the lack of rain and the drought. And the conversation was, I think, 10 times per day on, we hope it rains. And there was actually rain, but again, there was not enough. And what you did see there is the passion, the drive, the dedication uh, of these farmers, you, in being here at this time and being successful despite this drought that is so impactful on all of us. A little bit further north, there are, again, clients that are facing different challenges with the floodings. And it is uh, deep in our heart, the hurt is there for the loss that they have of their cattle. Some of them lost all of it. And of course, as a cooperative bank, we stepped in and did what we could immediately to make sure that they get the attention, they get the support. We help them get back on their feet. But it is so directly visible what the impact can be of these extreme climate instances that are there. Uh, and we see them real life, and they're there. They're also the manifestations of the things to come. If you think of ahead, ahead in terms of the climate change that lies ahead and the impact that that can have. Also, at their, at their land where we were there, they had activists only the week before. Activists going out and saying, you should stop herding cattle. We should stop eating meat. Activists that are arguing for radical change in the agricultural sector. They're there on their premise. 
it seems to be there is a strong divide emerging between the city and the rural parts, with the younger generation and the existing generation, with the, the ones who want to do what is right for the world, feed the world in the right way, and the ones that want to have more radical change. This divide is visible and tangible. We seem to be heading into a perfect storm, where on the one hand, we need to start to feed about 10 billion people in about 30 years' time. We face the challenges of climate effect. We see the, the attention to the soil, the biodegradation of the land. We see the nutritional problems. We are, in a way, running into a perfect storm. And so you wonder, will we get that through? Now, this year, it is 50 years ago, that uh, Neil Armstrong set foot on the moon. And if you think about the challenge that they started, a little, little over 20 years before that, to say, we want to put a man on the moon. We use technology that is not there. We want to use a rocket that's not been built. We want to put a man on the moon. And they did. That challenge is phenomenal. And if you, I don't know whether you've seen this capsule in which they actually landed, or flew to the moon and back. It is on display in Washington uh, for the world to see. And you see the capsule in which these astronauts came back. It looks a little bit more like a car of the Second World War, frankly, in terms of the types of buttons and wiring that's in there. And if you imagine what it takes to do that and celebrate that this year, 50 years ago, and then transpose that to the challenge that lies ahead, you start to think, we ought to be able to do this. But I think it is the nature of that challenge on the one hand. On the other hand, it's a different challenge. It is not a perfect Neil Armstrong with all the wiring and all the skills and all the dedication that all the organization behind him to do the right thing and get to the moon and land this orbital lander on the moon. This man doing it all right and coming back alive. The challenge ahead is not this one man. The challenge ahead is actually a planet a, a movement by all of the inhabitants of 10 billion people, about seven right now, but going to 10, all needing to change. Production needing to change, eating habits needing to change, concerns about behavior needing to change. It's a small step of mankind itself that will make the next leap. And I think the 50 years is a good place to reflect. Now, as we drove uh, on Tuesday across this fantastic uh, property, we were driving around the, the bushes, and all of a sudden, uh, we run into a tractor. And this tractor had been clearly around for a while. And I was sitting next to, um, to the, the owner. And he said he was getting emo all emotional. Because he said, I didn't know this thing was still around. And it turns out it had been the tractor, the truck, with these uh, tires and then a, a shovel in the front, with which he individually, on the age of 19, had started to take away the forest on that slotted land that he and his family were awarded. And he said that the direct line for, between that tractor that we run into and the, the company that he now leads, an integrated supply line of pastures, in the inside of the lands, the back, backlands of Brisbane, all the way down to the processing plants on the shoreline, feeding thousands, millions of people, and doing that in a way that is responsible, that direct line shows you it can be done. And when I was interviewed yesterday by a journalist um, of one of the newspapers locally, asking me, do you think Australia has a role to play in this world that we're facing? I said, yes. And I refer to a book I read recently. It's a book by, uh, uh, by Friedman, Brian Friedman, who is called uh, The Next 100 Years. I don't know whether you've seen it, but he attempts to project what will happen in the next 100 years. And what he says is, frankly, there is no rational behavior. And if we take the vote that took place just now in the UK on Brexit, I think you have a case in point. There are some irrational things happening to this world but he said, if you take a 100-year perspective forward and look back, 100 years back, to learn, there are patterns. And one of the key patterns that he raised, he said, if you own the key to the food supply, you own the key to the future. 
And so he projected that in the next 100 years, strength will come from those who have an oversupply of arable land. So my argument to this journalist yesterday was, you have here about 0.3% of the population of the planet and 5% of the arable land. There is an answer. And if you combine that with what the farmers have done in the last 40 years, and there has been an agricultural revolution taking place here in Australia and in New Zealand, and also, by the way, in the Netherlands, the country I come from, that revolution shows you, you can make enormous change happen in the context of 40, 50 years. But it seems to me that somehow or another, with that success, we've also run into a phase where we've not found the optimal sustainable solution of doing it for the next 50 years. So the question is not whether we have that challenge that Kennedy so nicely portrayed when he talked about going to the moon. The question is, how will we get it done? And we believe, looking back, what you have done, what your families have done, what you as entrepreneurs have done, the success story of these clients that we visited only yesterday, if you portray that to the future, it will be done. It's a matter of stepping forward. And let me tell you how it's done. Uh, and I'm not going to give you the answer and the prediction of how you are going to do it at all, but we as Rabobank are dedicated to help make that transition happen. And in our minds, there are four things that need to happen. Four things. First, we have to look at the earth, the production side. Second, we have to look at the nutrition, the consumption side, the foods that get eaten. Third, we have to look at waste. And finally, we have to make sure that it, that, that whole flow is resilient, and that stability gets organized. Only four things. And let me take you through those four things one step at a time. Earth. Under the simple scenario of 10 billion people eating what we in this room eat today, in 2050, we would be needing four planets. That is simply impossible. So there is a huge challenge to make the use of land as about a third of the global arable land is degrading in a way that makes it unusable going forward. The challenge will be to make our Earth conserve it and make it sustainable so that it can produce. At the same time, if you take the most productive agricultural countries, New Zealand, Australia, the Netherlands, and apply their technology, what they can do on their land, to that same arable land we have, you can feed the planet. So it is about how can we do that in a more sustainable manner? How can we do it so that the biodiversity doesn't get undermined structurally? How can we do it in a way that the chemical substance that we have used in the past will be not used in the future? How can we do it in a way that this planet is available for future generations? We can and we should. And we as Rabobank have been involved in many initiatives around the world of identifying those innovations with you. We do it with the World Wildlife Fund in Brazil, where we work with farmers to find innovative ways of having them use more sustainable practices on the border of the, where the forest starts so that they don't continue to deforest. We're doing it with the United Nations, where we put up a billion uh, US dollars fund to incentivize farmers to shift from the practices that they're used to to a more sustainable use of their, their soil. It can be done. We need to make those steps forward. Our foundation has about 250 projects around the world helping smallholder farmers to adopt smarter ways of farming. We need to find a way of make Mother Earth produce what the population towards 2050 need to eat, Earth. The second thing we need to do is Nutrition. If you look at eating patterns, there are about 2 billion people obese, uh, over uh, eating, uh, and about uh, 900 million literally obese to the end, to the side where it becomes very unhealthy. There's an equivalent number on the other side of the equation of people living in hunger. The trick is to find an eating pattern that's healthy. This can be done, because there are now new insights in terms of how it's done. If you look at the the latest report, the Lancet report that was done, it starts from 
how can we feed this world in a sustainable manner so that it's on the one hand possible to produce, on the other hand that it's actually healthy in its mix. And my colleague Barry, Barry Martin will later on uh, in the afternoon present on how we think it can be done, how we can feed the world in a nutritious way so that health becomes into the equation. And you do see the younger generation already having, adopting those eating patterns. And we might wonder and say, is that a fad? Is that a permanent? But from the calculation that Lancet has done in its report that was groundbreaking, it showed that many of the behaviors that are there are actually what is needed in the future. We need to help make that shift possible, nutrition. And we, as Rabobank, are dedicated to new partnerships with health organizations, with uh, the public sector, with private sector, to identify how we can link nutrition to health and do it in a sustainable manner. The third, waste. About a third of the food that we produce today gets lost or wasted. And if you turn that equation around, of all that is eaten, there's an equivalent half of that that gets lost. So we have 50% available somewhere in the food supply chain that gets lost. It is the third biggest contributor to CO2 emission reductions and other emission reductions if we get the waste right. It's the biggest lever on the planet that we have available, and it's right in the middle of the food supply chain. About a quarter of the food that gets bought in the Western world goes into the bin. About a quarter of the, the agriculture produced that is from the most productive lands on the planet in Africa gets lost by the roadside. We collectively need to find ways to address waste as an issue. And it's no wonder that this conference talks about waste. And this afternoon, we'll present the new report that identifies how waste can be reduced right here in Australia. And it's a promising report, because there's reductions, but there's a need to go on. Waste is the third lever that we collectively need to find out how to get our arms around. And we, as Rabobank, are involved in many initiatives around the world where we find new business models. It turns out that a dollar invested in the reduction of waste earns itself back 14 times. The biggest business opportunities lie in the reduction of waste. And it's good for the planet, it's good for the money, it's good overall for all the quality produce that you also produce, waste. And the fourth lever is resilience, is stability. If we want to supply, get the supply that potentially is there in the earth, and we want to bring it to consumers that want to eat healthily, and we do not get waste, on, uh, uh, waste lost along the way, providing st stable supply chains is the lever. And, and also on Tuesday, we talked about the big steps that are made in Australia in the integrated supply of, of um, pork and other meats, where you, if you bring the integrated supply line into effect, you can actually create more stable prices, you can produce more stably as a farmer, you have more predictability, you can invest in the next scale of scale-ups. Stability is actually a key that's not an abstract notion, it's very nearby. And we, as Rabobank, are, are continuously finding ways to offer new services to stabilize uncertain shifts, to find best practice, to share with you where that lies and to help you find those. That's our, our mission. So four effects. Mother Earth, production, nutrition to healthy patterns, waste reduction, and resilience. These are the levers that we collectively need to pull. And then we can do it. We can fly to the moon. There's a, a bonus lever that I wanted to share, a bonus lever, and the bonus lever is called innovation. The bonus lever actually says, if we're smart, if we adopt new practices, if we find ways to innovate, that will offer new opportunities. And if we remember the words by Kennedy saying, and I don't know whether you've heard his speech or seen his speech when he said so, we need to adopt technology that's not yet been proven. Innovation is the root. And we are also, as a bank, dedicated to offer and invest and fund innovative ideas in different ways going forward. I hope you recognize that as you encounter us. I met a, um, I met a wonderful uh, cook in the Netherlands uh, only a few weeks ago. And his name is Henk de Veldhuis, and he is the cook that supplies the, um, the food for the Olympic team in, the, in our country at the training site. And this training site is called Papendal, where he has his kitchen. And he, it turns out that, th that their recipe is so good that now supporters from around the world come to train in Papendal to have the rest, to train and to eat his food. 
and he talked about what, in his mind, a highly performing sportsman or woman needs to eat, and he has actually delivered. So he has put science into effect, innovation into effect, measures all, all the calories, the substance, and he discovered this. He said, the optimal mix is one of a lot of vegetables that are produced nearby with meat in proportion. It typically is the cheaper food stuff in the, the supermarket because it lies in places that is lower on the, on the stacks and it is just right there in the fresh, food, the fresh department. And if you look at that mix, it is actually the more sustainable mix when it comes to an imprint on the planet. And so he, he has developed this ideal mix for these sporters, for them to perform at the highest level. But if you think of it, it is healthy, it is sustainable, and it is cheap for the consumer. So there is an answer and it's possible. And I think it is our challenge to combine to find that. Now, it's where I shift to us and you. We as Rabobank, a cooperative bank, have made it our mission to help our clients, you, to make those next moves in the next era. And it is quite easy to look at that shift as something that is difficult, complicated, challenging, it's politically loaded, it's, it, it raises activists. But really, if you think of it, it is winning, it's about winning the next transition. We've won the transitions in the past 40 years massively, you have. It's about winning that next transition. And we hope, we wish, and we are honored to be, and we're happy that you are here to be the partner of you in that transition, in winning the next era. We as Rabobank, a cooperative bank, are present throughout the world in the food supply chain. We are, have about um, 160 billion uh, Australian dollars in investments throughout the world in the food supply chain. We serve about the uh, 28 of the top 30 dairy companies, for example. But we're also in Africa, where we serve 5 million smallholder farmers on their first steps towards being getting access to the food supply chain. We are there, and we've made it our mission to help you in the, winning the next era of the transition and the food supply to the world. That's our mission. And so we look at you as, as our partner in that mission. We hope and we are happy and honored to have you along, uh, alongside and be able to be a partner in that. We look at you as a partner in the journey, and we are a cooperative bank, and a cooperative bank has members. And our members formally come from the, where the bank has come from, from the Netherlands, 120 years ago. But we've stepped out into the world, and we are now so honored to be here with you for 30 years in Australia, 25 years in New Zealand, as one of the hopefully preeminent partners in, in your life and in your future. But a cooperative has members, and so we would like you to be and to feel like the members of that cooperative. And if there's anything that I hope that today will bring, the conference of today will bring, is for you to explore new ideas, to, to see what it takes to get inspired, to learn, to connect to your fellow entrepreneurs, your fellow leaders in the agricultural journey, but also that you feel as a member of this cooperative bank. And so, if we just step back for two seconds and reflect on what John F. Kennedy said when he was at Cape Canaveral on the way to, um, to, um, to visit the, uh, the NASA site. He, and this is a famous anecdote I, I frequently use, but I think the metaphor is so beautiful. He ran into um, the, the first person he met on the way in, and he saw a, a man, he was swiping the floor, swapping the floor, cleaning the floor. And he walked up to him and said, what are you doing? And this man said, I am helping putting a man on the moon. And this is, I think, the essence of what, what this mission stands for. It is something that we hope binds us together, and that if you meet anybody of Rabobank anywhere around the world and you ask him, what are you doing? I hope he or she will say this, I'm helping growing a better world, our mission. And I hope you feel too that we are the partner in that journey growing a better world together as a member, as a partner, on the way, doing it together. I hope you enjoyed the day. I hope you enjoy meeting everybody. I hope you enjoy this unique moment here in Australia, in the Bay of Sydney, in this island. 
that so much unites us. Thank you very much for being here, and I look forward to the conversations. Now, I have one more thing to do before I'm off the stage, and then I promise me you won't see me back. Um, but we also want to acknowledge one other stakeholder in the, this journey, and that's the media. And we have been, as Rabobank, been connected to the media um, throughout the years. And we want to acknowledge their importance in the dialogue about the transition of the agricultural sector, about how the beautiful agricultural produce gets to the consumer and how that needs to be connected about a factual debate on what it takes and about a factual debate of what you as entrepreneurs in that, that sector are doing. The media is crucially important. And we've been a sponsor of um, the national associations and the international associations of agricultural journalism throughout the years. And today, therefore, I'm here, uh, and that's my last task, is to give a prize. And this is the prize for the best journalistic piece uh, that has been produced in the last year. And it is um, also in the presence of um, Pete Lewis. Where's Pete? Pete Lewis here is the chair. There you go, Pete. Thanks for being. Pete Lewis is the chair of the Australian uh, Council of Agricultural Journalists, and uh, we are honoured to have you in the room, uh, Pete, to represent also this important partner in uh, in the media. But let me uh, then read to you the argument for the the, the prize of this year. Um, the uh, and the prize is called the Australian Star Prize for Excellence in Rural Broadcasting. And I'm reading the report of the, uh, of the, um, the committee that assigned it, an external committee. This year's winner is a very deserving story. It's realistic, it's powerful, it's a good and nice portrayal of the challenges of severe drought on a farming and regional community. But it also very beautifully and uplifting in its nature, it is a portrayal of the strength and resilience of the human and community spirit in supporting one another and facing these challenges. I cannot underscore this choice enough at this very moment as the winner. And so the winner of the this year's Star Prize for Excellence in Rural Broadcasting is Michael Brissenden and the Four Corners team for their story, Proud Country. Michael, where are you? Come on stage. Congratulations. Very well done. Here you go. That's the, uh, now you need to, uh, you know how this, this is done. Yeah. <laughs>